you might recognize our next guest from the first ever episode of the Into the Mind podcast. Ali Houston is a former physicist turned keto and paleo expert. In this podcast, we cover everything from keto, paleo, mental health, and also the carnivore diet. If you want to learn about how to tailor your diet to suit your mental health and how you can improve your mental health based on your diet, then this is the podcast for you. Before you fire on and listen to this podcast, if you have ever taken any value from these podcasts, if you could please hit that subscribe button, five-star button, follow button, whatever it is, wherever you are, I'd really appreciate it. My name is Harrison Brown, and this is the Into the Night Podcast. If you're watching or listening, I hope this helps. It's so good. Um, so since we last spoke, it's episode 19 now, can you believe that? Amazing. Wild. Uh, since we last spoke, I've actually started, I'm probably like 80% of the way there, yeah. I'd say. There's times that I have binges of certain things, and I find that because I'm kind of keto now, yeah. when I do have carbs, I binge mm. instead of just having it to a normal extent. Does that make sense? Interesting. Why do you think that is? Well, how do you feel before and after you have the carbs? I feel terrible after carbs now. Okay. I, and I, I definitely feel, uh, for example, whenever we film a podcast, I will never eat carbs. I'm always at lunch. I'm like, I'll only have maybe eggs. I'll, I'll maybe have like peppers in it, like tons of veg uh, or chicken. And I'll never have any carbs now because I know that it clouds my mind so much. Wow. Um, and, and especially after we last spoke, like I just realized that it, it, it does just give you so much brain fog. Mm. Um, why do you think it is that, that carbs give you brain fog? I think there's a few potential mechanisms and I think the answer is quite similar to the question of why do ketogenic diets seem to help brain fog and other kind of mental things so much? Mm. Um, at the moment, there's several really plausible theories and the uh, research is kind of ongoing to properly pin down why. But it all starts in the gut. Mm. So some people who... Uh, think that maybe ketogenic diets aren't particularly um, good for you or, or, or good for your mental health. They might point at traditional societies that eat lots of carbs and there's mm. lots of them. So um, I, can't, I think I spoke about him last time, Weston Price, the dentist who traveled the world a couple of times looking at so-called primitive societies like 100 years ago, mm. just in time because they more or less all disappeared after that. Um, and by primitive, I mean not tapped into the modern food environment, not eating sugar, flour, vegetable oils in the kind of quantities that we do. Also things like alcohol, drugs, uh, modern additions to food that are food-like substances that help with um, preserve, preserving them or um, flavor enhancers, stabilizers, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, these, uh, these so-called primitive societies had a wide variety of diets. So it might be that you look at the, the Inuit in kind of uh, the northern parts of the world and they were eating what was available to them mm. and thriving. So that would be like seal blubber. And um, sometimes they would get mussels from uh, sea caves. And uh, then in the summer, they, in the autumn, they might get a few berries. But they were basically carnivores mm -hmm. eating... Um, lots and lots of fat for calories. Uh, same kind of thing in the Maasai tribesmen. Mm -hmm. So the women eat more plants, but the men, they are cattle herders. And if they want food, they'll just sort of nick one of the uh, the veins of the, of the cow and bleed them a bit and drink the blood. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't kill the cow, doesn't really harm the cow, just uh, gives the herder a bit of food. They also drink about a gallon a day of, of the milk, just raw. Um, then you've got traditional Japanese people, 80% mm -hmm. of their calories came from white rice, just like a processed carb. Mm -hmm. But until recently, longest lived peoples in the world, uh, very low rates of heart disease and, and so on. Um, no apparent, uh, epidemic of mental health problems. Similarly with other groups up to 95% of their calories coming from carbs. Mm. So all of these people were kind of in the picture of health, 
but this wide variety of diets. So people who are kind of resistant to the idea that ketogenic diets can really help or that carbs can give people brain fog or whatever, they might point at these people and say, well, they were fine. Yeah, so so why wouldn't we be fine? carbs aren't the problem. Mm. The issue with saying that is that the so-called primitive people, they would be um, raised in a very different way to how most of us were raised. Mm. And it's just the terrible side effects of modern life. So um, if you're born naturally, then you're, you're not quite sterile when you're a newborn baby, but you're near, nearly. And so the, the bugs, the biome that is in you comes from your mother when you are born, when you're coming out, on the way out, basically, everything that you encounter goes into your mouth and down into your gut and forms your microbiome and seeds the microbiome. That's an important part of it. So if you're born cesarean, and there are reasons why, you know, babies have to be born cesarean, but I think it's done a lot now where it doesn't necessarily have to be done. Um, you miss that out. And the uh, the thing that colonizes your gut is are the bugs that are on the like the midwife's hands. You know, so that's mm. so that's not really how it's meant to be. Um, people in prim primitive societies would have been born naturally. There's a big um, temptation, which I completely understand, and I'm not judging anyone, to uh, bottle feed rather than breastfeed. Mm. And um, that changes how the microbiome is. It's there's not natural. No, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, um, and I'm always careful around um, praising something that's natural over something that isn't because just because it happens in nature doesn't mean it's a necessarily a, a really good thing. Mm. You know, um, we have uh, startle reflexes because we might get bitten by a rattlesnake or a, um, a saber-toothed tiger. I don't want to be routinely startled by <laughs> rattlesnakes and saber-toothed tigers just because it's natural, mm. you know what I mean? But um, certainly being born cesarean and having... Um, but being bottle fed with, uh, you know, soy milk that's got um, vegetable oils in it and sugar sometimes, you know, it's it's obviously not as good as breast milk. Mm. I think everyone agrees on that. Even the milk companies, they have to say it on their adverts. Um, antibiotics decimate your microbiome. And, you know, they're a great thing. If you've got an infection, take antibiotics, you won't die. That's a really good technology. But if you have a dozen rounds of antibiotics in your first 10 years of life, then your microbiome has been really messed with. Mm. Um, plus all of the, the eating that undoubtedly affects your microbiome. So we're surrounded by uh, foods which are not evolutionarily appropriate. Mm. You know, foods stacked with sugar, flour, modern veg oils, and, um, you know, there's like 4,000 different food additives that companies can use now legally to enhance the food in some way. And we really don't know what they do mm. to us, either in isolation or in combination, plus all of the environmental uh, potential toxins that come from pesticides on food, um, you know, uh, antibacterial, antifungal, cleaning products that gets into our digestive tract just the list goes on and on right mm. so um yeah if you come from like the garden of eden then you can eat carbs mm. if you've been raised the other way the modern way then your gut might be in a state where if you eat carbs then bad things happen and that is just what we see now, you can talk about exactly why, um, and this is sort of my initial point in that big rant, was like, why does keto work? Why do carbs give you brain fog? Mm. And if your gut is compromised, then you can have pathogenic microbes like bacteria or fungus or whatever in the gut that can um, get into the bloodstream where they shouldn't be, and they can produce chemicals that can get into the bloodstream where they shouldn't be. And one of the main ones that a lot of people talk about and it's been researched well is called lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And 
uh, bacteria in the gut can produce LPS, it can get into the bloodstream and cause systemic inflammation mm. and neuroinflammation. And so, um, you know, they can inject LPS into rats and they remain depressed for months. It's very profound, it's a very profound effect. Another thing is that we are evolutionarily adapted to being hungry and getting better at hunting as that happens. If you think about a hunter kind of striking out for a day or two, the hunters that would survive that process would be the ones who would get better at hunting the hungrier they got, not worse. Hmm. So eventually you'll starve to death, right? But the evolutionary pressure there is that the organisms that get better at hunting, the longer they go without food, the more successful they'll ultimately be. Yeah. And so what happens there is the body starts, when it runs out of glucose to use mm. from carbs or from um, gluconeogenesis, the, the bodily process that creates its own glucose, then when it's depleted, you start running on fat. And you can run on fatty acids, which is just the fat being used directly or the liver can turn it into ketones and you're in ketosis mm. and the brain loves ketones. It just loves it. Like if you look at it on a, a, a sort of molecular level, the efficiency of using ketones for producing energy in the brain is better than using glucose. So the brain loves ketones. And so you could be eating carbs and getting brain fog because of an, um, an unhealthy gut from all of the abuses that I spoke about. Mm. Or you could be using ketones to fuel your brain and then not only will you be getting the, the benefit of the, uh, the brain loving ketones over glucose um, and the more efficiently producing energy, but you'll have an absence of the pathogenic bacteria producing things like LPS. Mm. So it's like a, a win-win. Mm. Um, you know, uh, besides systemic inflammation, LPS, brain-loving ketones, um, there's oxidative stress and uh, a ketogenic diet is, um, is better avoiding that. You know, um, carbs are not just like one thing mm. and different people can tolerate carbs, different carbs in different ways. So I, mean, I know you want to talk about carnivore later, but, um, you know, a, sugar, a sugary donut is a very different food to a sweet potato, mm -hmm. which is a very different food to, um, a, you know, a piece of kale or something. They, have, they all have carbs in them, but they'll all act quite differently in the body. Do different stuff. Yeah, and um, it really depends on the individual. Some people find that, you know, they don't get uh, brain fog at all with any carbs and they're fine. Um, other people, myself and yourself included, um, have a problem. And for me, it's, it is almost any, any carbohydrate, you know. So you find you eat anything. So say you were to have like a couple of chips, would you feel an impact of that? It depends, you know, uh, I love the, the, uh, the Heraclitus uh, line, you know, a person can try and step in the same river twice, mm. but they're not the same person. It's not the same river. Mm. So, you know, you, you, even something that works for me now or did six months ago might not work now or in six months. Your body changes, doesn't it? So I suppose as you get older as well, because when I was young, I could eat like seven cookies in a row and mm -hmm. feel fine. Whereas now I eat like three and I feel sick. Yeah. I'm like, what, why did I do that? J just going back to something interesting you said about the kind of hunter-gatherer times and how in some of these uh, sort of caveman times they did eat carbs, right? I suppose they were fasting between meals as well, which would release ketone ketones. Yeah. Because they would have been hunting anyway. Well, if we can speculate about that, it seems likely they would. Mm. I mean... The skinniest, ma even the skinniest marathon runner has like 50,000 calories of fat on them. Mm. And, um, you know, you see persistence daytime hunting. There's an old David Attenborough clip where you basically, uh, the hunting technique is you, you just run the, the beast down until it 
until it gets too tired in the sun and mm -hmm. and it has to sit down and you, and you can kill it um it seems likely that we are built to use fat when we need to mm. um you know if you look at modern hunter gatherer tribes like there's a few left the hadza are one example and they're fascinating to study um, but I'm not sure how much you can extrapolate about our evolutionary kind of path, pass, yeah, path and past because they've been pushed into uh, an ecological niche, which is not where we used to be. Like mm -hmm. they're on the edge of the game reserves; they're not allowed to hunt uh, lots of the the game. So um, there's only so much you can tell about our past and how we evolved by looking at modern hunter gatherers have been pushed into these weird little ecological niches and, and geographical areas, but there is other evidence. So you can look at, um, the, uh, that is the stable isotope evidence, um, in the fossil record mm -hmm. and see that, um, human, human, uh, hominids, basically, you know, human like, uh, uh, beings like us have in times gone by been hyper carnivores you know they've they've you can do stable isotope analysis which tells you basically how much protein uh, is concentrated in the uh, the, the organism that mm -hmm. you're measuring and you know hominids of that era come out as uh eating more meat than wolves so wow. almost like we're hyper carnivores and you could argue that maybe they're having a lot of seafood. There's other ways you can, you can, um, focus that, uh, the stable isotopes, but that's a really interesting data point. Hmm. And until about 10, 15,000 years ago, there was megafauna on the earth, um, to a much greater degree. So you had like giant sloths and, uh, woolly mammoths and that kind of thing. And, um, they kind of died out quite quickly. That, well, so there's a theory that they were hunted to extinction. Certainly it seems like, you know, uh, early humans would trophy hunt and mm. and hunt just because they could. And other animals do that as well. They sort of hyper hunt and um, over hunt uh, just because they can. But it's not clear to me that that's what killed out the, the megafauna because a lot of the large animals in Africa survived, but not really North America. So there's some interesting stuff around the younger Dryas impact theory about 12,000 years ago. Um, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But it's certainly true that the megafauna died and, um, and they would have been big fatty animals. And, uh, you know, we're hunters. We've got, you know, the rotating shoulders that are good for throwing things. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, our skills are based around hunting. I suppose as well, though, we, we are kind of adapted to eat what is easy to us, like do, do have the easiest path for the maximum reward. Yeah. So if there was hundreds of thousands of woolly mammoths yeah. and these megafauna creatures that we could kill quite easily, mm -hmm. it would make sense that we'd be majority carnivore because why grow stuff that takes months when you can kill something that takes Absolutely. Second? And that's where the argument in the academic world goes very quickly uh, is what is the, the calculation there? Mm -hmm. And um, Mickey Bendor is a really interesting guy, Israeli guy who's been on my podcast. And, um, you know, he's done amazing research on, like, what is the calculation? Like, mm -hmm. if you think that early humans grew their brains by eating tubers, which some people think is the case, um, then do the calculation. Like, if you look at any sort of patch of land, how how many calories does it take to exp to find a calorie of tubers. Mm -hmm. What about hunting a big animal? And you just do the calculation. Like if you if you kill an elephant, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably a million or millions of calories. And you could feed everyone in the tribe for a week or two, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know, approximate numbers. Yeah. But foraging for tubers, that's not going to give the same yield. No, it's going to take a lot of time. Yeah. Plus, if you think about, our, I think one of the best uh, um, arguments in favor of uh, meat and fat as our sort of default is our digestive system. Mm -hmm. And 
it's kind of weirdly argued in both directions. You know, you get vegans who say, oh, we've actually got a, a kind of plant eaters digestive system, but I don't buy that. I think we've got part of our digestive system, the large intestine really, which is a, a, a throwback to when we fermented more fiber for fuel, but it's tiny. Mm -hmm. Large intestine is by far the shorter compared to the, the small intestine. And our stomach, acidity is pretty much the same as canines or vultures mm. and you know vultures are uh you know eating pretty much rotting meat and so why do they need that acidity mm. it's because rotting meat is covered in microbes plus it's packed together tightly the nutrition it needs to be broken down mm. so acid and digestive enzymes are absolutely essential to break down protein and fat and humans have like basically the same stomach acidity as vultures do you think digestive enzymes can be changed based on what you have as a child because there's an interesting thing uh, and you mentioned it earlier where babies were being bottle fed like yeah and the, the, some of the stuff that is in that bottle feeding might not be necessarily good there's actually uh, information within a baby's saliva that's passed the nipple during breastfeeding that tailors the mother's milk on what the baby needs oh wow i thought that was incredible i looked it up after because i was like that must be bullshit but it's actually true and i'm just thinking if 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 the milk is being so tailored from the mother uh that's being stripped away and it's being bottle fed could that change the digestive tracts of what actually the baby can have yeah i mean the digestive tract is very complicated and there are so all sorts of cues from all sorts of things in all of the food that you eat including mm -hmm. mother's milk um, you know, it starts from day one and it's, it's quite easy to, to mess it up. You know, if you've ever had uh, a stomach bug and then it's taken months to get properly better, yeah, you know yeah. that it's, 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 it's not that hard to mess it up quite badly in the short term, um, and quite difficult to get it back to where you want it. I think that's true of, of foods affecting it too. Um, and, you know, dairy is an interesting one as well because, you know, it's hard to imagine in nature uh, or in a, a primitive society, a human being having milk mm. over the age of two or three. Um, Whereas now they're having it until they're, in my case, 26. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's understandable. I think, again, talking about technology and not just dismissing something because you don't see it in nature. I think we are apex predators who kind of have earned the right to decide how we get our calories and nutrition. Mm. And we've worked out a way to corral animals that are domesticated that you can milk. Mm -hmm. And so you've got like a stable source of, you just need to put them out in the field, yeah. in the sun where the grass grows and you get all this nutrition. You know, you don't have to even go to the bother of hunting anymore. It's clever. But, you know, and also there are people who are in the picture of good health who have dairy all the time. Like Weston Price saw the Swiss in the mountains eating uh, bread and having cheese all the time mm -hmm. and really healthy. But then I would say again, you know, all that stuff about gut health, they would have been born how we spoke about earlier. Yeah. No antibiotics, no... Um, cesareans no uh bottle feeding yep. no uh ultra processed modern foods the gluten in their bread would have been lower much lower because of the type of flour they were using and also they would ferment it mm. which would break a lot of the gluten proteins down and the dairy would have been raw unpasteurized and um not homogenized and they would they would have been in an, an extremely acidic stomach with the enzymes that were adapted to deal with that, mm. and so in those circumstances you can be you can be fine with dairy, but then a lot of other people find that they're not, and I think people can get better. So I think one of the main positive actions of a ketogenic or a carnivore diet is that it starves these pathogenic bacteria hmm. and helps to heal uh, damaged gut lining. And so 
um, you know, you, you can you can make the problem a lot better and feel a lot better mentally, all the way from brain fog right up to people getting better from bipolar disorder, yeah. schizophrenia, you know, the worst mental disorders. Yeah. But does it mean that you've fixed the underlying problem or are you just not adding fuel to the fire? Mm. Because a lot of people find that when they, the minute they go back, like you're finding, mm. the minute they have carbs again, then they get the problem again. Yeah. So has it really fixed it or does it just prevent it from flaring up? It's an interesting question. It's a good question. I think th uh, from experience, I think it's maybe a sticking plaster, but I don't know how you would fix the underlying problem. I know that my brother had quite bad in in inflammation in some of his joints. He was lifting weights and he had some inflammation. And he said when he went on the carnivore diet, and this is something I wanted to ask you about, his inflammation just like t totally went away. Mm -hmm. Like he was like, I've never felt better. It was expensive, mm -hmm. but he was like, I've never felt better. Mm -hmm. Why is it that carbs cause inflammation? I'm not saying it's just carbs, but they're a primary factor. Mm -hmm. Why do they cause inflammation to the joints? Or what is it about a carnivore diet or a keto diet that stops the inflammation? I need to interrupt this podcast really quickly to bring to you a word from our sponsors. Chisholm Hunter are the sponsors of the Into the Mind podcast. And without Chisholm Hunter, we would not be sitting here today. They have helped us on a totally new venture to them, which is very, very unique, especially when it comes to old fashioned retail, which luxury goods tend to kind of be. They specialize in luxury watches and also luxury diamonds, bespoke luxury diamonds. They're world renowned for their bespoke diamonds and they have 29 stores throughout the UK. And to top it off, they're actually family run, which is pretty incredible. So if you're looking for your next luxury watch or diamond, head to chismhunter.co.uk. That's chismhunter.co.uk. And on that note, back to the podcast. So I think that it's always complicated. There's never a single biological pathway. Mm. We've been evolving for so long from billions of years ago that every single thing in the body does multiple things. And so, but you can identify plausible mechanisms for carbs causing inflammation, mm. for modern foods causing inflammation. And again, I would bring it back to gut health. So... A lot of experts talk about the inside of the body starting at the small intestine. So, mm. you, you know, you might think that the outside of the body ends at the mouth and then the inside of the body begins there. But a lot of experts talk about the inside of the body only starting in the small intestine where nutrients start to be absorbed. And um, you've got a kind of door system, lots and lots and lots of little doors, millions of little doors in your small intestine that open and close on command to let nutrients into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. That's how you get your nutrients. And um, there's a substance called zonulin, which was only discovered or I uh, isolated fairly recently in the 90s, I think. And um, it opens and closes these doors, which are called tight junctions. So um, Alessio Fasano is an Italian researcher who works in America done a lot of work on this and he identified that gluten proteins were upregulating, kind of mimicking zonulin. Mm. And so uh, gluten was opening these doors when they shouldn't be opened and things get into the body that shouldn't be there. Mm. And you want your immune system to be robust, right? You want it to learn what a threat is and deal with it swiftly. So uh, an infected cut, it hurts, it's inflamed, but you want that so that it gets better. And that's like, you know, barbarians at the gate. You fight them off, you don't let them in. But what happens if you're habitually letting all sorts of mad shite into your bloodstream mm. and it goes all around your body and your body thinks, well, this is an invader. And, um, you know, it's like, a, an, it's like an invasion of the country. And yeah. the army fights that and it feels bad. You feel inflamed. Mm. Um, if the attacks actually come from um, something, there's something called uh, molecular mimicry. And the process is, is very roughly speaking, um, that things get into the bloodstream 
and the immune system sees those things in t- tissues in your body and starts to actually think that it's the it's your own tissues that are the problem and that's autoimmunity right yeah and then the immune system starts attacking yourself and that's like an, a civil war it's not yeah. barbarians at the gate it's actually you f- fighting your own tissues mm. and a lot of uh autoimmune arthritis a lot of other autoimmune conditions where you're chronically inflamed in a particular way in a particular organ um, or areas of the body are caused by that mm. and so if you've got a pathogenic bacteria in your gut and uh you know food fragments um you know uh dairy fragments that can get into the bloodstream via a leaky gut Hmm. because gluten and other things have uh, decimated the defenses, opened up the doors when they shouldn't be open and things are getting into the bloodstream, then that is one major pathway that you can find that anything that flares up either the doors opening when they shouldn't or pathogenic bacteria in the gut will keep having the same negative effect Mm. and carnivore i think even over and above keto and i've had quite a few clients who have felt somewhat better going low carb or keto who then had a quantum leap and their life was transformed by going carnivore um and some people that happens on keto Mm. but i've had clients where it's only happened on carnivore and like they've gone from feeling better and you know losing weight and you know generally doing better to literally saying i feel like i'm in a state of grace like yeah i i i i don't have worries anymore like mm. it, profound and it lasts for years you know the um what's going on there nobody knows for sure my guess is that what you're doing is you're really really starving any pathogenic bacteria that yeah. could have fed on even plant fibers, uh, the small amount of sugar or starch that's in a keto diet. Mm. So there's also toxins in plants. And um, if you think about like a bison, then it's it's going to run away from you. It's in a herd. It could stampede you. It's a dangerous procedure trying to hunt yeah. uh, large animals. And it's difficult to catch small animals. So they don't need their meat to be poisonous because mm. if something's eating their meat, it's too late. Yeah. So they've not evolved those kinds of defenses. They've got sharp teeth. They've got claws. Mm. They've got legs to run. Plants want to survive and pass on their genetic information. So they need to have defenses. They place. need to have defenses and they're just sitting there. Mm. And so plants have uh, defenses that, you know, taste pungent or um, are brightly colored. And, you know, the, the most plants on earth will kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a very small number of plants that we can actually eat that won't seriously harm us. And a lot of the ones that we eat now, we've kind of created, you know, like broccoli doesn't exist in nature. A lot of the green veg the brassicas were kind of all from one like kind of weedy mustard plant Mm. um and they've been like carefully cultivated um i'd say that you know plants can be used as medicine that's something that you see in all sorts of different uh you know unrelated primitive societies Mm. and they can be used as a fallback food you know there's not they're not usually the first preference except maybe like fruit in tropical regions or berries in in uh, late summer and early autumn so um plants and, and fruit slightly different in berries because you know they want to be eaten yeah because they pass on their seeds right exactly that's how yeah. they do it um but there's a genetic engineering thing that goes i think we covered that we might have touched on it last time i i don't even know if i told you this so i was in sri lanka I think it was just after we had our podcast Mm -hmm. and the bananas in Sri Lanka versus the bananas here are like totally different. Like they're short, stubby and very fibrous. Mm. Whereas the bananas here are huge, sweet and very squishy. Mm. Um, So is there a thing that with genetic engineering, 
because we want our fruit to be big and sweet so that more people want to eat it. Yeah. Is there a thing with genetic engineering that causes more sort of issues with the gut? Well, there's some there's something that a lot of low carbers talk about that they're much sweeter now. I think it's hard to get more glucose into it, but I think like you say, the um the sh- the sort of Sri Lankan ones, the unmodified ones, are uh, typically more fibrous, mm. and so you don't have access to as much to, as much of the sugar. I mean, I kind of think that if you're metabolically healthy, then fruit should be okay. Mm. Like it's growing freely in the tropics, and it's not just genetically modified or you know engineered bananas uh, or any of the uh, other of the fruits that are undoubtedly changed over the years to be bigger taste sweeter more palatable mm. and, you know you get papayas that have always been like that that you, you just pick off the the bush and and eat it it's amazing mm. you know and um tropical regions where there's fruit all the time and people very healthy indeed so i kind of think that if you're metabolically healthy it's okay and um, I'm not sure if you've seen Paul Saladino. Uh, he's a he's a doctor who um, was on carnivore for a long time, carnivore MD. He started to eat honey and um, fruit mm. again, and was you know kind of modifying it. And I think if you are metabolically healthy, then a a diet full of meat, uh, fish, eggs. And fruit is evolutionarily compatible with mm. you know, how many people likely uh, evolved and thrived. But if you have these problems, you know, pathogenic bacteria in the gut, um, disrupted gut barrier function, then intro- reintroducing fructose can be devastating. Yeah, and uh, it's as I say, it's just very difficult to. Put a um, finger on it. To put a finger on it and to eliminate what's there. Mm. There's a lot of digestive tract and the bacteria in the gut are, they don't want to die either. So they produce biofilms which protect them so that even if you starve them, they're not necessarily all gone. Mm. They can survive for long periods of time, essentially dormant. And so that if you, this is why I never recommend cheat days to people and what you're finding is that when you're off carbs, you feel magic. Mm. And then the minute you, t- you have more, something yeah. flares up. My best guess would be that it's something going on in the gut. Yeah, I, I would think so. I, just thinking about last night, I was, I was having a cheat day and I got a curry. And I was like, right, I'll eat this curry and I'll have a little bit of rice. As soon as I ate the rice, I'm going to say half an hour, 45 minutes later, I was on the couch and I thought, fuck, what have I done? <laughs> and it's so weird. It's like... And I think I'm more hypersensitive to it now because I know how I feel when I'm not having it. Mm. Because when I am in probably ketosis, when I'm just eating salads and meats and eggs and stuff like that, you feel you know how great you can feel mm-hmm. or you know how great you could feel. So you know how bad you feel when you're off of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's another thing I was going to ask you about. This is quite interesting. Over time, because it kind of brings me back to, to the banana thing. Over time, people's jaws are getting smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, generationally and you can see this in like wisdom teeth where before they would grow in and they would be relatively pain-free they're now colliding with other teeth your jaws are getting smaller and it's because partially because we're not chewing tough foods and we're not opening up those airways in our nose and also our jaws uh, are just shrinking because we've got more squishy stuff Mm -hmm. do you think that part of the reason that a carnivore diet helps people so much is that it opens up their air airways slightly because they are exercising those jaw like jaw muscles again i think that can't be a bad thing mm. i actually saw a photo of myself the other day and i thought i think my face shape has changed in mm. the kind of eight years i've been doing this and um you know I, I think i think it helps for sure uh you know the sort of dental occlusion where people have like crowded teeth and everything yeah is is a modern problem it's you know our faces have narrowed uh the jaws have narrowed the airways are, are squashed um i think there's definitely something in that i think because a lot of it's developmental mm. uh that happens in the first kind of 10 or 15 years of life 
it can be hard a hard thing to reverse if you've got a small jaw you've got a small jaw sort to, of thing to to first degree i think but you do see, i think you do see a difference in people um but you know i think like for some reason in society uh meat is thought of as less healthy than fruit and veg and less nutritious and i think neither of those things is true and I think the healthiest food is uh, red meat. Mm -hmm. So that if you're eating a lot of beef and lamb, then that's a brilliant place to start for a healthy diet, in my opinion. And so, you know, I know people who feed their babies, when they start feeding them solid food, they feed them steak mm. and the babies love it. Um, wh where does it say in the, in the Bible or the history of the, the world somewhere that we have to feed babies pureed mulch mm. you know like they they can't handle anything bigger it just you know it doesn't make sense to me that you would give them less nutritious food when that, they're younger that works their jaw out so that they're being cultivated in a way that isn't natural yeah because because you're right back in the day they would have given them what they had which is normally meat yeah whereas now they're giving them grill kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, 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 this, uh, the whole thing about ketogenic diets and metabolic interventions for brain health comes down to what you're actually making your brain from. Mm. You know, uh, I think a lot of the time psychology and talk therapy can be helpful for people. It's been helpful for me in the past. Talking to you sometimes feels like a good therapy session release <laughs> but uh the i think that's working on the software mm. when you can work on the hardware you know like if you're trying to run the latest game on a 20 year old pc mm. it's not going to work so why not just upgrade the pc mm. and i think you know m mine and uh, my partner at metsai uh, rachel's teacher Dr. Georgia Ede, hmm. um, who I think I mentioned in the in the last podcast, she's a brilliant psychiatrist from America. You know, she she always says uh, studies have shown conclusively that the head is in fact part of the body, <laughs> and so what your brain is made of is what you're eating, and if you're not eating the right stuff, then your brain won't be made of the right stuff, hmm. and it's a it's a fatty electrical organ you need omega-3s and you get them yes from fish and seafood but also from grass-fed ruminants like mm -hmm. beef and lamb um, and you need the right amino acids in order to create neurons to create um, you know all of the all of the stuff that is in brains a healthy uh, brain upgrade your hardware yeah. and focus less on the on the software mm. and um you know, it's true of babies, you know, they're making their brains as they grow. Mm -hmm. And so they need the right stuff to get the right hardware. Yeah. Yeah. And it's imperative in that developmental stage because uh, there's some things that can't be reversed for, for example, exactly. that, that kind of biome. And also let's say, let's say jaw strength and health and, and, and dental uh, health. If you were to feed your babies tougher stuff, when they're growing up, potentially they won't have those dental issues when they're mm -hmm. older with wisdom teeth growing in and crowding in their jaw. Yeah, and there's a big question mark around, um, so, you know, it's it's certainly happening now with clients of mine, um, with doctors and, uh, you know, other clinical evidence and some um, scientific evidence in the studies now that mental disorders are clearing up using mm -hmm. ketogenic diets. So whether that's brain fog, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, you name it. Mm. If it's a mental disorder, very often ketogenic diets can help. Sometimes completely transform someone's life and they don't have symptoms again. Mm. Brilliant. But what about autism spectrum disorder or ADHD where uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. So I'm very interested in that where they're thought of as developmental disorders rather than mental disorders and the, the, the distinction is that something happens during development 
where something irreversible takes place and the person is therefore like that. Mm. And there's also the neurodiversity movement, which would say that um, at the extreme end that some people are like that and we should accept them for that and, th and that's how it should be. I would say that there's a blend of things going on so that certainly with my personal experience of ADHD symptoms where I would get brain fog and inability to focus and, um, you know, uh, kind of various other things that are sometimes ADHD adjacent, like depressive symptoms, anxiety, mm. that could be related to what's happening with the ADHD because it's harder to perform the way you know you can, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, they really went away when I changed my diet and lifestyle. So did I have an irreversible developmental condition or did I have um, mm -hmm. symptoms that were brought on because I continued to eat like that? So do you think you've, cu not cured, but do you think you've, uh, you, you've, you've done away with most of the ADHD symptoms with the ketogenic switch? Yeah, because this is, this is why I have one foot a little bit dipped into the uh, developmental uh, neurodiversity camp mm. because I still have some of the hallmarks of ADHD I love being involved in multiple projects at once and get really kind of switched on by that. And that's like, you know, a million tabs open on Chrome, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's not a problem anymore. Mm. And I can organize myself and I don't have brain fog. Mm. I feel mentally clear. I still have the kind of um, creativity associated with ADHD. Mm. So in that respect, I feel like maybe I am neurodiverse but it's not a bad thing. And that if I think about that in evolutionary terms, then it would be good to have someone who was creative, who wanted to, who was dead keen on doing multiple projects and getting things done, mm. um, or even getting things started and then working with teams to get things done. Yeah. You know, that's, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have ADHD symptoms that, uh, you know, if they, if they get their diet and lifestyle right, then they're not a problem, they're a, they're a strength. I think autism spectrum disorder can be a little bit different because um, the, in the popular imagination, you know, it's about, uh, there's the, you know, the, I think people think that a lot of people with autism spectrum disorders are like Rain Man, they're sort of highly skilled at, in a very narrow field of focus. But I think oftentimes it's really just um, very, very hard and mm. um, they're, you know, they're not more skilled, they're, they're impaired badly and so that's where i diverge from the neurodivergence thing i don't think it's a good thing i think mm. we need to work out what's causing autism spectrum disorders and stop it yeah. and and also dial in diet and lifestyle to improve that and there is some evidence it's sparse mm. but this is why i think people making changes with their diet and lifestyle in a way that's very low risk and they can try easily. All they need to do is is change their diet. How does that harm anyone? Mm. And they can see if it makes a difference. And if it doesn't, they can just go back. Yeah, the the foods, the other food's still going to be there. Yeah, Krispy Kreme's still going to exist in two months. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um. So, I think that's that's like where a lot of my clients feel empowered mm. because they've suddenly got control of something that they always felt was out of their control or had happened to them in the past through some kind of neurodevelopment um, thing. unlucky thing. Yeah. Um, and they, they realize, no, actually, I'm in control now. And like you, mm. they can have a curry mm. if they want and they might feel rubbish, but it's their choice all of a sudden. And also they know why they feel rubbish. Yep. I think a lot of depression or anxiety uh, is about not actually knowing what is going on and yes. why you feel a certain way. Whereas if you if you go on a keto diet and let's say it does work or a carnivore diet and let's say you feel clear, you've got less brain fog, uh, you, some of these symptoms, inflammation goes away, all that kind of stuff and you feel better and then you have a curry, you feel, well, this is a passing thing uh, that I feel shit after having a curry because I know how good I can feel when I'm on the keto diet. Yeah. And it's that kind of like, knowing why yeah. something was happening. I feel like a lot of anxiety and depressive illness is just not knowing and thinking that you were broken, 
but actually maybe you're not broken. Maybe your diet is broken mm-hmm. or maybe you don't exercise enough. Maybe your exercise routine is broken or your sleeping pattern is broken. Yeah. It's not your brain. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, uh, we had a gentleman called Brian Costello on the podcast and he is a therapist and he really stressed that. He was like, people aren't normally, typically, there's some variance in that. Some people have genuine neurological things going on. But people, normally speaking, aren't broken. Mm-hmm. They've just got things that they need to change in their life. And I think the ketogenic diet could be one of them that could possibly help. Yeah, definitely. And is that going on at MetSci? So are you you're kind of teaching people um, how and guiding them through these diets? Is that how how is it kind of working? Yeah. So um, MetSci is a coaching platform, mm-hmm. and me and my uh, co-founder Rachel Brown who's a a senior psychiatrist in the NHS we want to educate people Mm. and give them high quality information so that then they can make choices about what they want to do Uh, we tell them about what's worked for our previous clients and for people who've gone through research studies uh, for mental disorders and uh, talk about ketogenic diets and lifestyle interventions that have helped Mm. And it's also about accountability. So whether that's one-to-one clients of mine or group coaching clients, um, people want to tell people how they're getting on. And so part of it is about imparting really high quality information. Mm -hmm. And the other part is about letting clients know that you're there for them. Yeah. If they need to talk about more information or if they just want to tell you how they're getting on or if they just want to turn up somewhere to feel like they're accountable because a big part of uh, this whole thing is food addiction Mm. you know there's no two ways about it food can be addictive sugar sugar is one of the most addictive uh, is it the most addictive drug in the world they say well i mean it depends how you measure it but you know Certainly some of my clients would agree with that statement. And I think a reasonable measure of food addiction is do you identify as being a food addict? And no one can really answer that except you. And a lot of clients of mine have identified that as as a big issue. Mm -hmm. Now, part of it is, it's quite complicated, you know, part of it is um, social cues. You know, we're used to doing something, so we continue to do it. Part of it is hedonistic sugar is definitely hedonistic and that's not necessarily a bad thing you know a steak tastes amazing as well but very hard to binge on steak yeah yeah yeah. um and so there's definitely something in that uh you know it's it's devoid of nutrition a lot of the time Mm. Uh, there's a protein leverage hypothesis that we will eat until we have had enough nutrition specifically amino acids but really so you you would eat something until you have enough enough of that thing to your for your body to think you've done it sufficiently like yeah had enough. that's the protein leverage hypothesis so that for example a Krispy Kreme donut yeah is so devoid of nutrition that you'll keep eating it until you get enough nutrition from it but you, you'll, you'll be sick first because it's so devoid of nutrition that is so interesting I wonder if that's I'm looking at you I wonder if that's why I binge see when I when I uh, fall off the bandwagon so to speak I'll eat like I think it's kind of an ADHD thing I'll eat like a pack of cookies. Mm. Like it won't just be the one. Yeah. If I buy the pack, you best be like, I'm going to eat the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like Brian Regan, the stand up. He talks about the American cookies, Fig Newtons. And mm. it's like a serving is two Fig Newtons. And he's like, I'm eating these things by the sleeve. Yeah. I'm like yeah. a wood chipper. Yeah. It's like shards flying. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, that's what I would do. And I wonder if it is, I think partially there's an ADHD thing where I'm dopamine, because I've got ADHD as well, where I'm kind of dopamine hitting on that cookie so to speak mm-hmm. but potentially there's something in my brain saying i've not got enough uh, nutritional value from this keep yeah. eating it yeah well this is the thing that a lot of people find they identify as food addicts and they've never been able to take control and mm. it's scary they feel out of control and then when they start eating the right foods for them mm. that quietens right down sometimes goes away that's what happened to me mm-hmm. really since i've gone on a ketogenic diet and you, you, you'll back me up here because I I was really bad for it in the studio, especially. I would just get cookies and I would mm. fucking ravage them. Like I would be terrible. And uh, 
since I've gone, I'd say, yeah, 80% of the way there. I'm mm-hmm. not quite there, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely carb devoid now. Like I'm not uh, as, as in love with them. I've kind of just stopped eating shit. Mm. Every now and again, I might have something, mm-hmm. but comparatively to what I was, it's second to none. And I do have, I remember I messaged you about this. Mm-hmm. I've, I've uh, definitely correlated my going into a state of ketosis with not binging on crap food. Mm. And I suppose, and I wonder if that's, uh, that's probably linked, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm. You know, when you're doing the right things, it can be like a virtuous circle where things get better and better. And then if you do one of the wrong things and it can be a bit of a vicious circle where, Mm. you know, they feed each other in a negative way. So that if you're uh, enjoying being in ketosis, enjoying eating fatty foods, Mm. um, fatty animal based foods, then, you know, the uh, addictive tendencies quieten down, Mm. maybe in a weaker moment where you're stressed, hungry, tired, and you just want something fast and Mm. a bit of a hit in terms of your mood, that's when you're tempted. Mm. That'll kick you out of ketosis and then you don't have the benefit of the ketones anymore. Mm. And sometimes people can, you know, say at Christmas, for example, they'll have some, they'll have, they'll have, they'll take the tin of roses passed Mm. around to them five, 10 times. And they sort of come to in March Mm. and they're like, oh, what just happened? Yeah, yeah. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah, that, that's so interesting. Uh, but I think it does come back to that thing that we were talking about earlier, that people will kind of gravitate towards the easiest option. And sometimes for some people, the easiest option is the pack of cookies. I'm a bit hungry. Instead of making some chicken salad that might take me 10 minutes, there's a pack of cookies there. Maybe I should I should binge. Mm. And I think that kind of... It, it, human nature has always been to like make things more easy whether mm-hmm. whether that's like you know faster internet faster broadband you 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 have a, a you know just things just become more easy faster cooking faster ovens things that heat up I know we used to have agas and that would take a long time to heat up and then we'd have to cook things whereas now we have faster stuff that's what people kind of tend to gravitate towards is making things easier for people whereas i believe that sometimes having the hardship of something will benefit you in the long run. Mm -hmm. So for example, making a chicken salad instead of having the cookies, maybe in the the long run or probably in the long run, that will benefit you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Yeah. It's it's such an interesting, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I I just feel that people are kind of hardwired to do the, the easy thing and to break that trend is really difficult especially if you've been in it for such a long time like overweight people have probably been in the trend of uh, getting takeaways so much that they actually forget and can't really remember how to cook certain things so it's harder to get back on the bus does that make sense yeah and there's a skills gap and i think people know how to cook less now they know how to deal with um different cuts of meat Mm. awful less maybe our grannies or great grannies would cook that stuff all the time routinely um and deliciously but you know it's also a lack of understanding Mm. so that people are avoiding fat and i think the protein leverage hypothesis is good up to a point but it's really difficult to overeat beef or lamb fat Mm. it's just almost impossible to have you know more than um what your body needs you know it's you can't you can't eat more. It's, yeah. it's exquisitely matched to our physiology. You know, if you have a fatty cut of beef or lamb, like lamb breast or a beef short rib or like an untrimmed beef ribeye, then it's not the protein only that you're getting. It's the fat soluble vitamins that are in the fat. It's the calories you're getting from the fat. Mm. And I'm telling you, if you get adapted to that, then it's exquisitely matched to your, uh, you know, your sense of fullness and satisfaction. And a lot of people who routinely eat a lot of addictive foods and think about them a lot, plan their day around them sometimes, that just goes away for the first time in their lives. Mm. And uh, it's very freeing. It is very freeing. I think that uh, especially people, I think a lot of it, which is what Met Sai is going to be really good for. Uh, when does the app come out? Do you know? 
it's it, it's any week now, any so week it's, now. it's really it's really close, yeah. And um, be out on iOS and Android, and it's 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 a free app, mm. so people can get information. They can go on the free forum, and they can use our tracker to put in variables like, uh, you know, are they measuring their ketones? Are they measuring their mood? Mm. Are they measuring what they're eating? And they'll start to correlate and say, you know, you've been eating. Uh, this food and then two days later or the next day your mood is rubbish yeah so yeah. after a few weeks it'll be able to sort of suggest where there's these correlations um you know so we want to give people the information and the support that they need hmm. um so that's been transformative for people in terms of one-to-one -one coaching and group coaching that that we've been doing and that we're still going to do but to be able to give some to give people an app that 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 gives them all that for free in a sort of basic form that's that's important to us and I think it's important to doctors and other healthcare professionals who we're talking to, who really want to they they you know they understand the power of this mm -hmm. and so they want to recommend something to their patients, but it's very difficult because there's nothing in the uh, the the current frameworks that is ready to go you know, that they can refer their patients to. But free resources are something that any doctor can ethically yeah. recommend to their patients. So that's one of the main reasons we brought the app out is to empower clinicians to let their uh, patients know about this stuff in a quick way because GPs only have like four minutes with, with their patients. It's not nearly enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then if people are interested, then they can kind of upgrade and they can get more support, whatever they need. If they're like me, they just need the information, they can run with it, mm. perfect. Mm. We wish them all the best and they can use the free app as long as they like. But if they need you know, a little more support, a bit of accountability because they maybe feel food addicted or yeah. they don't quite understand everything and they want to ask questions, then they'll be able to get a monthly membership, group coaching, one-to-one -one coaching, whatever works for them. Yeah. And I think the accountability bit, I was going to ask you that. I think that it's so huge. Like if you think of uh, people that go to the gym that have a PT, mm -hmm. normally they don't really need the PT after three months, mm -hmm. but they keep the PT because the PT keeps them accountable for actually coming to the gym. Yeah. I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way. I, yeah. I think that just people operate in different ways. Like, it, and when you look at people that are uh, normally, typically speaking, I don't want to generalize here, but are unhappy, maybe depressed, maybe overweight they're not accountable to anyone. They're only accountable to themselves. So like if you look at someone that's overweight, they might live by themselves uh, and they, they get into the routine and they have nobody to tell them maybe there's a better way of doing things. Whereas this app that you're developing will probably uh, generate an accountability theme so that they need to document what they eat, uh, how they feel, mm -hmm. And they can see it, like they they can they can physically see. I ate, you know, a burger and chips, and I felt shit. Maybe I shouldn't do that again. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like I have my Garmin now. Um, this is not sponsored by Garmin. We'd love it if they did. But <laughs> uh, my sleep has always been an issue, and especially when I drink alcohol. So mm -hmm. I've, I've I don't really drink alcohol very much anymore. But my your Garmin uh, or your device that's strapped to your wrist, it might not necessarily be a Garmin. It, it, it tells you what you kind of already know, but it formulates it in a way that you can be like, fuck, that's mm -hmm. really bad. Like if I drink, my REM sleep drops to literally zero. Wow. And that's when your brain is in recovery, right? Yeah. So when you drink, if you binge drink, and I, I, I urge anyone listening to this to try this, when you binge drink, you wake up in the morning, your body's probably recovered, but your brain is exhausted mm. and it's not processed a ton of uh, information. It's not been through those REM cycles and to have a device that tells you that it's been so bad mm -hmm. and that everything is impacted by what you've done yeah it kind of like uh, urges you to cut out the shit so to speak yeah and i think that that, that this app that you are developing um will kind of do that for people it will hold them accountable absolutely um you want kind of that external accountability so mm -hmm. it's not haunting your own mind and yeah. nagging at you. You know, I've had clients come to me who are very successful people who maybe are managers of scores of people. Mm. And they say to me, like, I can organize all of these people's working lives, mm. my own working life, and I can't control what I'm eating. 
it's bewildering yeah. to them. Yeah. But it's a fact. Mm-hmm. And so this external accountability, just like with a PT, um, really, really works. And 12-step programs, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, etc. They work for a lot of people much, much better than just sitting in isolation. And so we want to provide some of that external accountability. And it's difficult because, you know, I think some people have tried interventions in the past. Mm. If, if uh, like me, people found that maybe into their late 20s or even before they struggled with their weight. Actually, when I was a child, I struggled with my weight. And then it wasn't a problem until again, until I was like, in my late twenties, office culture, mm. um, and I couldn't keep the weight off. And I tried various things, calorie restriction, which works, but you're hungry and it's awful. Mm. And and then, it, then it fails because you're just starving yourself. Um, and you go through cycles of that because you're looking for information and experts are saying it's just calories in calories out. Mm. And so when you fail, you feel like you're the failure. Mm. And there's this cycle of change where people go from pre-contemplation where they're not thinking about changing, they're just getting the dominoes all the time, um, to contemplation where they're thinking, I really should do something about this now, to actually trying something. And it's that point, the contemplation to actually doing something that we want to meet people Mm. because we, you know, our system actually works. Mm. It's not calories in, calories out. It's not saying um, this is a willpower thing and you just need to stop eating those rich foods. We're saying eat the right rich foods and the, sh- the food addiction will quiet and write down, sometimes go away and you'll be in control all of a sudden and your mental health will benefit. And then they don't need to go through the cycle of change again. Mm. You know, unless they, and then we're all human and we all fall off the wagon if we're trying something like that. Um, from time to time. It could be that it's every few months. It could be that it's every few years. Some people stick on it, stay on it forever because they just never, never want to go back. Mm. But, you know, you'll ha- certainly know what you can do that works once you've done it once. Mm. That's the, that's the great power of this is we're not like sergeant majors or finger wagging, or telling people everyone needs to be on a ketogenic diet. We're saying, there's this tremendous evidence that ketogenic diets and carnivore diets are transforming people's mental health, even Mm. the most serious mental disorders. It's harmless. Why wouldn't you try it? And you can reverse it. (laughs) Yeah. Krispy Mm. Kreme's still going to be there Mm. if you want. And even if you do fall off the wagon and you find that actually your mental disorders or symptoms or, you, you know, your brain fog or anxiety, whatever it is, comes back, You've got this incredible tool at that point. That's what I always say to people. It's not a rule, it's a tool. Hmm. You know, you can use it whenever you like and it'll always be there. Hmm. And I suppose it's kind of like, <clears throat> again, with people, it's knowing that it's not them that are broken, that they can fix it. Uh, yes, and, the and, other and, and when you were talking about um, problems in your life and we've spoken a bit about therapy, I'm not saying that uh, when people have depression, anxiety, um, some of the more serious mental disorders, that it can't be linked to things mm. that have happened in their life. Of course it can. There's many ways into mental illness. Yeah. And it's absolutely clear that adverse childhood events and traumatic events, especially when you're young, um, in your formative years, are very tightly correlated with worse mental health outcomes. And we understand some of the mechanisms why that is, but you know, you wish, so you wish you could wave a magic wand Mm. and make these bad things have never happened to someone, but that's not how it works. So I totally acknowledge that. But what some people who have these dreadful traumatic backgrounds have said is that whereas before it was like consuming them, Mm. they couldn't think of anything else after they fixed their diet and lifestyle for a way in a way that worked for them, they were able to deal with it. You know, I've heard it described as they had all these knots before that were just too tight to untie. Mm. 
And when they sorted their diet and lifestyle out, they could maybe go to a therapy session and or two, however many they needed, and untie the knots and put mm. it behind them. I mean, that is huge. Yeah. So it's not that we're not acknowledging that there are these software glitches which come from um, traumatic events, adverse events, but it's that when you change your diet and lifestyle in the right way, you suddenly have an incredible resilience mm. that you didn't have before and that means that you can deal with it. It's amazing. And that's kind of, yeah, it's interesting that you say it, you kind of put it that way because since the last time I spoke to you, I want to say it was seven months ago, eight months ago, it was yeah, summer like that. last year, summer at some point, end of summer. Um, since I last spoke to you, I firstly went pretty much keto. Secondly, I make sure that I exercise an hour a day at least. That might be like an hour walk. It doesn't need to be a run or, or, or a go to the gym. It just needs to be an hour of something. Uh, and I try and keep to a really good sleep schedule. So I get up early in the morning. And I have felt kind of what you are describing mm. of the, the kind of knots of being anxious and not really knowing why mm. kind of fade away. Now, there's obviously things that will trigger it, like drinking too much coffee or, <laughs> you know, getting drunk and being hungover. That will trigger mm. it. But um, since the, the keto diet really, and also exercise probably helps, yeah. that has definitely been a factor in uh, benefiting my mental state of mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the way you described it, because that's exactly what I've experienced over the last seven months. And I wouldn't say that unless it legitimately was helping. Like, uh, I remember the first time I spoke to you and I was, it was probably the first podcast we did as well, which was probably, so I was like really nervous before mm -hmm. it. And I was speaking really fast and I was looking back at the podcast that we did and I kept repeating the same phrases because I was obviously just nervous. Whereas now I kind of know how to deal with it and say I get anxiety before a certain thing. I'm like, well, I kind of know how to deal with it. Don't drink any coffee. Mm -hmm. Have I gone a run today? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Have I, uh, you know, had a shit night's sleep? Have I drank? You know, there's, there's kind of tick boxes where I can be like, I can limit the amount of issues I have if I tick these boxes. And I think keto diet is definitely one of them. What What is your kind of opinion on um the port of call for doctors prescribing medication for mental health issues that could be depression or mm -hmm. anxiety well uh when i did my training on ketogenic diets for mental health with georgia Ede, um the psychiatrist that i mentioned earlier and in talking to my colleague rachel brown who's a senior psychiatrist in the nhs medication is clearly a massive topic in this mm. and roughly speaking what a psychiatrist does is assess the symptoms there isn't a lab test for mental health disorders it's about a clinical picture typically mm. and um, a list of symptoms and a diagnosis at which point there's an offer to the patient of the available therapies for which there is some evidence of efficacy and in terms of you know any particular mental disorder and any particular drug the evidence is usually patchy but inconsistent and certainly not applicable to every individual mm. so what it comes down to is let's have an educated guess about what might help. And if they're being totally honest, they'll also say it might help, it might not, and it might make you worse. And it might make you worse in ways that you've not even got yet. It might introduce new problems. For example, a lot of the, uh, a lot of um, psychiatric medication can actually make metabolic problems worse. And so mm. if that's at the root cause of things, how you're making energy for your brain, then introducing more metabolic problems is probably not a good idea for a lot of people. So some people get worse on medication. Some people don't notice any benefit. Mm. Some people, there is a benefit. But if it, was, um, if it was understood why exactly, then the prescribing would be a lot more targeted. Mm. And so it's still, <clears throat> a lot of it's guesswork. And trial and error, a lot of patients end up finding some improvement after a year or two of trying different medications and going through a hard time or even hell 
um, on these medications. And there's no denying that for some people they do make them improve to some extent. Um, I don't think there's anyone claiming that um, that drugs cause complete remission of serious mental disorders. Mm. So I don't think there's anyone claiming really that, you know, there's a deficiency of SSRIs is the root cause of depression or anything like that. So they can be a, t a useful tool, but I think they're far less effective than is in the popular imagination. In fact, mm. you know, there's some, uh, some researchers like Peter Goetje and um, Joanna Moncrief and others who have put out some very interesting stuff on actually how effective these drugs are and they don't come off very well in their analyses. Mm -hmm. So that's something that people can look at and make their own minds up. Another thing that I've had clients with is post SSRI sexual dysfunction or PSSD. And it's a bit of a silent epidemic. Yeah. And not only do people find that there's less sensation um, during use of SSRIs, but after they stop, sometimes people can have the inability to feel any sexual pleasure at all, seemingly indefinitely, sometimes for months or years, sometimes it's not come back at all. I mean, this is a dreadful thing to happen to someone. Mm. It, it like ruins their life in some important way. Um, similarly with SSRIs, 25% or so of people who come off them feel a worse depression than they ever had. Um, it's a little bit like the Wild West coming off them. It's very easy to go in and get them, mm -hmm. but dealing with those side effects and the withdrawal effects and um, potential damage uh, is, is not well catered for. There's a brilliant psychiatrist called Mark Horowitz who's just written a book called The Maudsley Deprescribing Guidelines. And it's about how to safely come away from some of these drugs. Well, as safely as possible. And um, that's going to hopefully empower doctors to help people to come off them when they've, you know, uh, used diet and lifestyle to really improve. Mm. Or some people do just find that they get better and they don't need to be on them anymore. At that point, they still need to be very careful about how they come off them. Mm. Um, just stopping them completely can be a disaster. Um so yeah, that's my understanding of the of the picture of pharmaceuticals and psychiatric medications. I was on Ritalin when I first got diagnosed with ADHD, and at first I quite liked it. It was a buzz, and the problem was I needed to take more to get the same effect. And when that happens, you start to notice the side effects more. There was a sort of rebound effect where I was actually having more brain fog a couple hours after taking it. Um, I was becoming kind of emotionally distant, a bit mm. um, cold, and that's often noted with stimulants. And so, I, it, it, you know, it didn't get to the root cause. It's funny you say that, that when I went on, I was on a citalopram. I'm not sure if that's how you say it, citalopram? I've heard citalopram. Citalopram. Yeah. I think Lemmy was on that. Yeah, so I was on I was on that, and I remember there was a distinct memory that I thought, "Fuck, this is really scary." I was at a party when I was like nineteen. Everyone was drinking. It was like uh, just a big party, and there was some guy that was causing like a lot of issues. And I remember he said something to me derogatory. I ignored it. He then said something again. He was just drunk. He was just coming up to me and just causing problems. I then like felt. And this is where it's just totally not me. There's like a sudden spurt of like aggression, but no anxiety anxiety around getting in a fight. Mm. Normally what happens uh, without the numbing agent of alcohol is that you get anxiety before you get in a fight because fight or fight, flight response, you mm -hmm. kind of need to figure out what's going on. It's a danger. The medication stripped all my anxiety away to the point where I could get in a fight and not have any kind of... Uh, adverse reaction to that mm. and th see at that point i remember coming away I, di I didn't end up getting in the fight but it was very close mm. like i was it was very very close i remember walking away and being like what the fuck am i doing like, that's horrendous to get in a fight it's just not me mm -hmm. and that's when i spoke to you i stopped them sh like just stopped taking them 
And it, as soon as I stopped taking them, the adverse side effects where I was driving in the car mm. start just my vision just went blurred, like so so strange. Um, and it's funny that the, the doctors don't really talk about when you come off this, you need to be careful to taper off very, very slowly. Yeah, and very, very slowly. Like, very slowly. Like uh, some people are, are doing hyperbolic tapering, it's called. Have you heard mm. of that? Where they, they take, um, you know, like a half off each time or, you know, because that'll just get smaller, smaller, smaller amounts. So they might be taking like grains of it. Yeah. But they still, they're still preventing the worst effects of withdrawal. So yeah. there's you know, these methods are having to be developed because of these types of problems. It's such a strain, but, but but nobody could ever say, they couldn't write on a symptom list of this drug. You may, it may cause you to get into fights. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just such a, it's such a weird spinoff. And I'm sure that there's so many other people probably listening to this as well that have had strange spinoffs from these drugs mm -hmm. that just nobody could tell them or like, <clears throat> warn them about mm -hmm. um but it's funny that you were talking about ritalin when i first started taking citalopram i got the same kind of buzz where it was i have no anxiety about anything mm. and then what happens is you, you keep upping your dose and i remember going to the doctors uh and she was like how many milligrams of citalopram are you taking and i was like oh well, 60 mm -hmm. and she was like you should be in like a like a like a home like you should not be outside if you're on 60 milligrams that's mental but my body becomes so accustomed to it mm. Uh, and I suppose it's kind of going back to your analogy of the PC. It's like putting a new disc into an old PC. You're not getting to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. You need to up weight, update the hardware. Mm -hmm. So your diet, go to the gym, sleep, all those kind of things is what you should focus on first before uh, perhaps going down the, the drug route, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one. And when we work with clients, we make it clear that if they're on psychiatric medication, mm. then they need to work with their prescriber because we're not prescribing medication to them. We don't have a doctor-patient relationship. We're, we're a coaching platform. And uh, if they're in a mental uh, health crisis, then they need to speak to a mental health crisis team. They need to speak to their doctor or uh, phone the Samaritans, mm. um, go to hospital, you know, um, mental health coaching is not for mental health crisis intervention. So there is definitely a place for the existing mental health um, uh, system. It's just that it, we would love to see it operate in a different way over time. Um, and that we can step in to support people who want to make these changes that can be so useful in the short, medium and long term and they've got to make that work with their prescriber if they're on prescription medication. Mm. I, do, I do believe that the percentage of people that actually have some kind of uh, chemical imbalance in the brain, and there are people out there, is very, very low comparatively to how much prescription drugs are being given out. Yeah, there's damage people. that can happen. You know, like um, the Oliver Sacks books, like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, mm. you know, people who have strokes or um, traumatic brain injuries, uh, they can be damaged in a way that, you know, you're not going to heal with however much diet and lifestyle you use, although you can protect. It's been shown now that being in ketosis protects from damage from um, traumatic brain injuries. So that if you're a rugby player, for example, mm. then you could uh, be on keto and, uh, you know, lessen the, negative impact of an impact to mm. your to your skull or um why is that so it's it's not it's not known but it, it's mm. uh it's thought that ketones are profoundly anti-inflammatory so if they're already there and ready to rock then yes you do want inflammation if you've got an injury but that um the ability of ketones to provide energy to uh, an injured site and to protect it from um, excessive inflammation, which may damage mm. the tissue. They're, they're sort of the theories about why it helps, um, but they know it helps. And um, it's, it's fascinating. And I think that, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of 
you, there's only so much you can do though like if, if someone's got a stroke and they mistake their wife for a hat hmm. or they you know the the the, the that that's an amazing book and ian mcgilchrist's book uh, the master and his emissary about what happens when people have strokes on different sides of the brain mm -hmm. it, it really shows up how our brain specializes and um you know the uh the the right hemisphere is the master in his analogy where it's like the wise monarch that is very good at understanding the common sense picture of things and making wise decisions and the left hemisphere is the emissary who should be like a skilled bureaucrat mm. who's good at, um, you know, maths and, uh, you know, using tools and stuff and, and can and be put to a task, but is not wise in the same way. Mm. Um, but what happens is the, in modern life, we kind of switched. So we, we believe much more in, um, uh, in, any scientist who's got authority rather than using our own common sense. Yeah. And, and, and we, we've lost a lot of wisdom given over to the, the emissary rather than trusting the master. And, um, I love Rory Sutherland, the guy who wrote alchemy, the book about advertising and marketing. And he, uh, he was talking about this kind of thing and our kind of eight bit inner monologue mm. that is like our consciousness is really a kind of left hemisphere phenomenon as far as I understand. So we kind of are very uh, willing to trust our own bullshit. And in a sense, it has to be like that. If you're a rabbit running away from a fox, then if you knew which direction you were going to go in next, then the fox would evolve to know too. So we have to be separated from our urges hmm. for our own health for our own safety but that means that our consciousness the bit that we're you know aware of the world is not actually the one that's making the decisions and creating these urges that are good for us that's the the right hemisphere our intuition okay. our wisdom the wise king so actually when we say i did this because of X, Y, and Z. Hmm. It's usually not because of X, Y, and Z. You're just saying that. You're, you're, that conscious part of your brain is really like the marketing and PR department. Okay. That is coming up with a reason why you did something after the fact. But it's just like an urge. Yeah. It's, 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 um, I'm trying to think of a, I'm trying to think of a concrete example. So if you were to eat like a, like a curry, mm -hmm. you would rationalize it to be like, you know, I, I maybe, um, I've not eaten, you know, uh, takeaway food in a while and I need to binge because I haven't had enough calories. I went to the gym today. Yeah. That's you, ra that's me rationalizing the curry I had last night. Yeah. But actually it was maybe just an urge from the other side of my brain saying you need this. Get it. Yeah. It could be, it could be that, you know, there's part of you that, um, is, is tricking yourself. It might not even be the wise king part, but it's like an urge that you are unable to control. And that can be quite scary in and of itself. So I think like um, that food addiction side can be very alluring. Mm. You know, any sort of addiction where it's seductive. Um, a concrete example from my life is I used to smoke heavily and I would, you know, I like what Mark Twain said, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> uh, and so I would quit all the time and I'd be like, that's it now. Yeah. And then part of me would, even if I wasn't particularly aware of it, would start thinking about how it could get its next cigarette. Mm. And so I would go for a few weeks and be like, that's easy to quit. And then I would organize a night out. Cause you wanted a cigarette. Knowing that I could say, well, I mean, I'm not actually smoking again. I'm just buying a 10 pack cause it's a night out. Yeah. And well, I'm having start. his, so it's not me buying it. Exactly. Yeah. And so we are very good at, at fooling ourselves in that regard and we've got to be aware that our consciousness in some ways is like the PR and marketing department of our brain, not the engine of ideas. And mm. um, so being aware of that can be very helpful. This is why things like meditation can be so useful because, um, you know, th thinking about how much anxiety there is, what our emotions are, it's not about 
going keto and getting rid of anything negative. Hmm. It's about sorting out your diet and lifestyle so that your responses to the world are appropriate and the right size and that you're able to recognize them for what they are and then deal with them appropriately. Have you listened to the Andrew Huberman podcast on smoking and nicotine on the brain? No. I'll send you after this. Yeah. You'd love it. It's so interesting. But there's a direct correlation between nicotine bro- blocking, and I'm, I'm don't quote me on this just in case anyone's listening because I probably will get it wrong. He, he sums it up in a better than, way than me. But there's a direct correlation between obviously smoking and losing weight. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is that there's actually a hormone in the brain that controls jaw movement and the urge to move your jaw. So people that <clears throat> typically, typically speaking are a bit bigger might have more of those that hormone in the brain so they want to move their jaw up and down more whereas nicotine blocks that receptor mm. so that when you smoke you don't feel like you need to move your jaw and you don't want to eat amazing and it's, it's really really interesting but he also talks about how it hijacks your feel good system mm-hmm. so everyone's had a cigarette here i'm guessing or, or vaped uh, that's the new phenomenon but after like that like couple of hits you feel you feel great you feel kind of warm and a bit uh, lightheaded whereas after you smoke for a while you feel like it's a compulsion mm-hmm. not you're not enjoying it anymore you're just doing it to feel normal you're, you're doing it to feel normal like I, i've i've my friends vape uh and they it, it's honestly a compulsion it's not like they they feel any better doing it they do it's just maintaining a certain level mm. so to speak um but it's honestly it's one of the most interesting podcasts mm-hmm. he's, he's a neuroscientist and he's he's amazing um something that i was going to ask you about that i noticed on your instagram cold water therapy mm. how have you found that yeah i mean it's something i've been interested in for a long time even since before i was uh, interested in diet i think uh i could just because when i would go wild swimming mm. i felt amazing so it's it's kind of that type two fun where it's not fun while you're doing it <laughs> but then afterwards you feel incredible and uh, there's this this place called uh, the Hot Box at Loch Tay, which is one of my favourite places. And it's like two hours north of Glasgow. Uh, there's a sauna that looks out over the loch. It's absolutely beautiful. They've got a, a hot tub mm. and a steam room and this little slide that dunks you in to the, do- to the loch. Oh, I'm definitely... What, what was it called? The Hot Box at Loch Tay Marina. I'm definitely going to take my girlfriend there. It's one of my favorite places. It's really great. You have to book quite far in advance when yeah. they open up the, the next tranche of sessions and um, because they go. And um, it's it's amazing. I was buzzing after it. Mm. And, you know, whenever I could, because I'm, I'm dreadful at being able to walk into cold water. Yeah. Like if I'm at the, in the Mediterranean or somewhere warm, I can easily get into the water if it's, you know, 20 degrees or something but in, in scotland or the uk i just i can't do it i need mm. to be splooshed in and then obviously Dunked. uh if there's if there's a sauna to get back into then mm. all the better so i'd also started reading because there's a lot of kind of biohacker types who are interested in cold immersion for health and i was like trying to evaluate whether it was really a good thing or not and the, the, the kind of area that I'm most interested in is energy. Hmm. Like Chris Palmer, who's on my podcast, has got a book called Brain Energy. Uh, Rachel, my uh, co-founder at Metsai, she's got a book called Metabolic Madness, which is really about the brain and energy and how we produce it, the metabolism. My, one of my heroes, Dr. Sarah Myhill, she ha- one of her books is called and she's a she's an expert doctor um maybe the the best in the uk on me chronic fatigue syndrome mm. um and one of her books is called it's not hypochondria it's mitochondria mm. so this idea that mitochondria the um the they've got multiple functions they've complicated as always but they are sometimes known as the, the power houses or the power stations of, of our cells if, if they're not happy then we don't have energy cyanide poison you know like uh, spies would have a pill mm. and if they chewed it it'd instantly die within seconds it's because it stops your mitochondria from working um so i'm all about improving mitochondrial health mm. and uh, one of the big things about fasting which keto- ketogenic diets happen to share is that it produces more mitochondria it's mitogenic 
um, and it it's, uh, it's it induces autophagy as well, where the 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 sort of worst performing cells are killed. That happens in ketosis as well as fasting. Um, that's just a wee aside. It's one of the reasons I don't particularly like fasting over and above ketosis because very often people with mental disorders don't feel good on fasting and they've been told fasting is this amazing thing. Actually, for a lot of people, it's a disaster. It really doesn't work. Mm. I don't like doing it unless in the summer maybe. But even then, I, I, just, I just like eating foods that are good for me until I'm full. Anyway, um, I was looking into the cold plunges and there's a difference between types of fat that are in the body and there's um, white adipose tissue, WAT, or brown adipose tissue, BAT or BAT, are quite different metabolically. I mean, some people think about fat as just somewhere that excess energy is stored, um, which is true, but it's, it's a, a hormonally complicated organ which has evolved to stop us from starving. And it also does all sorts of other things. So, um, talked about mitochondria, the different types of fat, producing energy. If you regularly immerse yourself in cold water, then you will transform some of your white fat into brown fat. Hmm. And one of the things that brown fat can do is called mitochondrial uncoupling. And it's when you've taken in energy and uh, the mitochondria are able to burn off excess as heat. So I think of it like, you know, in a, a um, like an oil rig, you've always got that flame at the top mm. that's burning off the excess. White adipose tissue can't really do that. Brown adipose tissue can. And what that means is that you are able to get warm on demand mm. and you're also able to burn off excess fat, uh, energy as heat whenever you need to so um you, you will, you'll just be warmer and uh metabolically healthier mm. because you're able to process energy in a in a, a better way in a more flexible way so i was really interested in that side of things mm. as well as the buzz that i got and what i found when i started doing it and this is another thing, the psychology of it really is, um, I live near uh, the docks where there's a water sports centre and the, the you can pay a fiver and go for a dunk, it's great, mm. but it's like 10 minutes walk and I, you can only do it a couple of times a week or three times a week, the rest of the time it's not open. I knew I wasn't going to do it, I just knew it, it's too unpleasant. Mm. And so I bought one of these um, cold pods for the, the back garden it's right outside my door it's sitting there it would be mocking me if i didn't do it yeah. i'd spent whatever it was 70 quid on it mm -hmm. and i thought right that's the way to do it and um yeah it, it was it was amazing within, within a week i'd uh, you know my my appetite had, had gone up uh my ability to be warm uh after eating had gone up like i was i was just feeling warmer and uh, and my mood was better. My mood's already good, but it, it was like an extra boost. An energy kick. So yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think there's definitely something in it. You know, there's a lot of biohacking stuff that I'm a bit kind of, I'm not that interested in because I don't think the experience of people in the, the science really backs it up. But I think with cold water immersion, it's brilliant. And um, if people can do it, in a stream or a lake that's near them, then that's great. I wish I, I wish I could, mm. uh, I wish I had one in my back garden or right next to me. But so I just stand in this thing that's filled from the garden tap and I change the water, you know, once a week or so. And I just stand in there first thing in the morning and I sit down and I'm there for two or three minutes. Yeah. There's, there's tons of studies on it in terms of, and I went to Finland quite, quite recently. You would have loved it because a lot of what they do is they cut a hole in the ice jump in and then go straight back into the sauna mm -hmm. and uh so we did stuff like that it was it was amazing but you're right though that after you do it you feel so warm mm -hmm. for no reason <clears throat> like you're sitting there and the heating's not even on but you just feel roasting yeah and uh and that's why i think partially in colder countries scandinavian countries they do it because they want to warm up and keep warm but there's tons of studies and again 
I need to do more research in this and uh, and reference people. But there's tons of studies linked to cold water therapy, breaking down certain cells. That your body goes into a state of shock. It goes into a state of survival, and it breaks down the the worst cells in your body, so to speak, first because it's no point in getting rid of the healthy ones. And those cells often are cancerous or could become cancerous. So the studies around it, especially with Finnish people uh, or Swedish people, people that do this kind of stuff, is they have have less cancer. And I can't remember what type of cancer it is, but they have less of a certain type or types of cancer because through cold and hot therapy, because saunas are obviously beneficial as well, um, they've broken down those cells that could have been cancerous. Uh, so there's just really interesting studies around the benefits of that. And I think Scandinavians have nailed it with that kind of stuff because they always do it in the morning. And we went to a guy husky sledding and he said that he has a lake out the back of his house and he would cut a hole in it. And every morning at 6 a.m. he would jump into that, stay in there for two minutes. By the way, it's minus 15. Yeah. Stay in there for like two, three minutes then run straight back into a sauna, get really nice and warm, then start his day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's almost like going to the gym in the morning or going a run in the morning. You just feel great after it. Yeah, You feel so good. And I think there's something really fundamental to uh, unlocking our kind of uh, rugged nature of doing these these outdoorsy activities that really benefit our brain. Yeah, totally. And as always, there's like, because we've evolved over millions of years, billions really, uh, going back to more f- sort of fundamental creatures, there's all sorts of benefits that will stack up mm. so that we can describe a few of the different pathways that will help, like I did with the brown adipose tissue, uh, dopamine um, that's raised for hours after cold immersion, mm. um, heat shock proteins in sauna, uh, and, um, you know, I, I think a big part of what's good about saunas is it mimics cardiovascular exercise because it, it, it gets you warm and makes your heart beat fast. Yeah. And um, I agree, there's so much good evidence, but the, these, all of these good reasons, these metabolic pathways, they stack up because we would have been exposed to these conditions whilst evolving. And therefore, we are the... Org- we are the um, we are the the children of the organisms who survived under those evolutionary pressures. There was lots of other you know, uh, genetic lines that died out because they didn't have the genetic material to thrive under these conditions. Mm. And so uh, I think putting everything through an evolutionary lens is a good idea and thinking, you know, would we have had warm showers every morning? Undoubt- uh, undoubtedly not. Yeah. And, um, you know, would we have cleaned ourselves probably it feels nice to clean yourself so we would have done it in whatever water we had cold which would have been cold water yeah um sometimes i think we're sort of semi-aquatic you know we came from the water a long long time ago we certainly there's something to be said for the amount of omega-3 that's in the brain Mm. that we evolved next to coastlines i quite like that um although there's certainly lots of omega-3 in uh, fatty ruminants as well so um i'm not totally sold on that but you know, all of these things that add up to good health, I think if you put it through an evolutionary lens, then it, it tends to make sense. I think it, it can be hard because you can tell yourself just so stories. Like, it's, it's unlikely we would have evolved with saunas, hmm. but yet they seem to be so good for us. That's an interesting one. Yeah, well, I suppose it's, it's yeah, that is an interesting one, but I suppose people that live in countries, let's say Indonesia, that's really warm and uh, it's really warm and obviously very humid. It's kind of like a sauna in itself, isn't it? So they'll have benefits that maybe people that are from cold countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, that, 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 you know, they, they wouldn't have that because they don't have both. Yeah, I think that it's kind of like learning from what works from every aspect of life. Brian Costello said something really interesting when he was on the podcast. And I think this comes back to uh, people are becoming more risk averse. They're not doing things that make them feel uncomfortable. And he said, he quoted somebody, I uh, can't remember who it was. And he said, the people or the monkeys that wanted to swing from high back branches of the trees, there was less of them because more of them fell and died. Mm. 
So there is less people that take extreme risks nowadays and through generations we're kind of whittling out the people uh, that take more risks because they die. Like whether that's a skydiver or uh, someone very extreme like in the SAS. So people feel more uncomfortable with these situations because through genera- like generationally we're kind of whittling out those risk takers. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think there there can be like uh, an erosion of uh, that that payoff evolutionarily, but you know, fortune favors the brave. Some people say, mm. and that the more you risk, the more the reward is potentially in some cases. So it just depends. Mm. It just depends. Like I think a lot of risk takers probably higher in testosterone might come across as more attractive to the opposite sex. And um, yeah, they might be more likely to die in a car crash, but uh, then they might also be more likely to um, speculate more and yeah. win more yeah. you know, in every sense of the word. Because they're more dominant. Because they're, they're willing to take risks that others aren't. And therefore, yes, they're you know they they are risking whatever that uh, negative is but their mm. their stand to gain whatever the potential upside is I, I was actually this is totally off topic but i want to hear your views on it there was a study with women that were on, on contraception whether that's the contraceptive pill or contraceptive injection and the correlation between being on these contraceptive uh mediums and picking a partner Mm -hmm. and when they're on the contraceptive mediums they normally go with people that have a narrower jaw and have Mm -hmm. less testosterone whereas when they come off the contraceptive injection or pill whatever it might be they are no longer attracted to that partner because they want someone with a squarer jaw and more testosterone Mm -hmm. and i was just wondering what your views on that kind of was this is totally off topic but no it's fascinating i think like any intervention on a population level Mm-hmm. is going to have unintended consequences. And that was one of the most fascinating that I heard about recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, partner choice is so inbuilt to our evolution. There's all sorts of complicated factors, but that was s- astonishing to me. Yeah. Was that basically at a population level, we are priming women to be attracted to a certain type of man more than on average another type and what does that do to society and it's obviously a very complicated question that i don't think you can just you know answer quickly but i i can't think that it's overall a good thing hmm. well, it's not natural is it well again i'm 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 happy to embrace technology that helps overall um, and just because something you know happens in nature doesn't mean it's good and just because it doesn't it doesn't mean it's bad but that you definitely get these unintended consequences and does that make women happier like yeah you see how things were for women in societies and they still are for some people where there's an incredible horrible judgment on premarital sex getting pregnant at all it's the woman's fault and then the woman has to deal with flipping kid they don't want for 20 years Mm. brilliant you know get the pill yeah so that is an amazing solution on the face of it it revolutionized so much but i think what i've heard someone say is that you kind of in some ways uh with with the the um the the shared uh kind of caregiving of children and the messing with the uh, hormonal landscape of women with the the pill um, you've you've definitely introduced a a new variable that nobody really knows how to deal with it was never there before yeah yeah and um, I don't think there's an easy answer I suppose that it causes women to be less selective about who they have sex with in essence because they don't have the risk associated with getting pregnant anymore yeah certainly initially i think that's probably true and then maybe um 
I think I'll, I, I I do know I do know women. And I don't know if this is true on a population level, but I do know women who who took that uh, kind of opportunity hmm. and didn't really feel good about it. And I know that there's a double standard that if you have sex with a lot of women, you're a swordsman, and if you have sex with a lot of men, then you're a slut, and that's like the <clears throat> the stereotype. Hmm. But I also think that it's not just about feeling judged in that way by the outside that evolutionarily it's a lot more costly for women to have sex. The risk there is that they become pregnant Mm. and they have to look after a child for 18 years. Mm. So for a guy, it's nothing. Literally can be nothing. And I've heard of tribes where they've dealt with this in different ways. One of the ways was that women would um, tend to have sex with more than one person. And that would mean that you just couldn't know whose child it was. And what that did was it bound everyone into caregiving for all the children. That is wild. Because nobody knew whose child, whose children they were. So they were everyone's mm. in the in the best way of looking at it. You know, dolphins do that as well. I didn't know that. So they have sex with, this is this is just wild to me. So they have sex with as many dolphins as they can because a dolphin will kill the child if they know it's not mm, theirs. Mm-hmm. So what the woman does, or the female dolphin, as a protection method is they'll have sex with as many dolphins as possible so that they won't kill the child. The male can, knows that they had sex, so it might be theirs. It might be their child. Yeah. Anyway, oat milk. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on oat milk? Oat milk. Um, Total Yui there, but... <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. We we we, uh, we were off on some tangent. Um, I think it depends on what people's goals are, really. Mm. Whatever food they're looking at. I think you have to live your life. Mm. And food can be enjoyable. And let you stick to your health goals. I think oat milk is starchy because it's from a starchy plant Mm. and it very often has added vegetable oils, seed oils, which I think are very unhealthy. And um, so I don't think it's a health food particularly. Yeah. But it doesn't have milk allergen, which can be really bad for people. And we can even pick up on how dairy can be a direct cause of mental disorder symptoms but um i think there may be better alternatives i think some people really like the taste and as i say if you like that you know if you like milk or that creaminess in your tea or coffee Mm. and it really is a deal breaker then and and you don't feel any negative effects from taking it uh then great and i think the great power of elimination diets like a carnivore diet is that I think the ultimate elimination diet is that you can get this very clean baseline of what of what feels great and then you can add something back in in isolation and get a really good sense of whether it's causing an issue. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm with you. And so even small amounts of dairy can cause people issues. And um, I think oat milk, like anything, the dose makes the poison. Mm. So... If you're having like a couple of teaspoons of oat milk a day or a few times a day, is that really going to move the needle much? Mm. Probably not. If you're chugging it, then you might notice that there's negative effects. Some people really do notice terrible effects from small amounts of of plants. But, you know, um, I would say the dose makes the poison and it depends on what your health goals are. Mm. You can get really clean almond milk which is just almonds and water um, without any of the kind of emulsifiers and that kind of thing. Um, Some people like coconut milk, but it's a very strong flavor. Mm. I love coconut milk. Yeah. Having that in cappuccinos is just great. Yeah, I like it as well. Um, And dairy for a lot of people is just a disaster. Yeah. So whether it's milk, cream, butter, cheese, and in this is this is something that a lot of people hit a wall with with keto is that you can wander onto a facebook keto group and everyone's extolling the virtues of butter cream and cheese mm. 
because mm. it's a they are nutritious sources of uh, beef fat, mm. really, or or you know ruminant fat. But it's c- totally clear from working with clients and from um, looking at what other practitioners have said is that people with mental symptoms of mental disorders very often uh, can cause them by having dairy and can make them go away by stopping dairy. We have a, I'm conscious of the time you have taking two hours up with you. Oh, wow. So we have a closing tradition on the podcast. It's new since you were last here and it kind of varies from guest to guest. What do you think is the most valuable lesson you've learned on your keto journey? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that there's really very little point in trying to get other people to do something. Hmm. So I've talked about that uh, kind of cycle of change that we go through. If we want to change, then we'll be on the lookout. And so all I'm interested in is talking to people who are in the contemplation stage or ready to take action hmm. because I'm not going to evangelize to someone who's not going to listen it's totally up to them i am not uh sergeant major sergeant major and i'm not invested in trying to change people's minds who aren't in that place that's the most important thing i've learned um it's what led me into health coaching Mm -hmm. and realizing that you you need to be completely on the client's agenda because if you're not, then you're just telling them to do something which takes the power away from them. Mm. And the whole point of all of this is that with the right ketogenic diet, you can take control of something which until re- now recently has been seen as a kind of spooky Victorian mystery, mental health. It's like, it's, it's a taboo almost in some societies still. And certainly a mystery to most and just something that it's like a sni- a hidden sniper mm. but it's not just luck you can take control but i've learned that telling people that has the moment has to be carefully chosen and the way it's done has to be carefully chosen because people don't like to be told that what they're doing is wrong yeah they like to find out through their own curiosity what they could do that might improve things for them and uh, I think that's the most important thing where can people find you metsy.com is probably the best place yeah. m-e-t-p-s-y dot com I'm on Twitter mainly but yeah. also on Instagram your Instagram's great by the way oh thanks I love following that kind of stuff especially the little see when you get into the ice bath and you're oh like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm talking about something else yeah like, yeah, um, yeah I'm on I'm on that as uh, Ali transforms yeah well, listen mate I really appreciate it and hopefully episode 30 or episode 40 we'll get you back in <laughs> yeah for sure back anytime thanks man thanks. I really got a pee yeah. <laughs>